So welcome everyone for joining us today um, for this webinar by our Raw 4 d colleagues Michelle Wilmers and Thomas King. So the topic for today's webinar is Research Data Management, Publication and Collaboration, Insights from the Raw 4 d Project. A bit of background on our speakers today. Um, we've got Michelle Wilmers, who is our is the um, publishing and curation manager for the Role for D Research on Open Educational Resources for Development project, uh, which is a, as you know a global South networked initiative, um, engaging over a hundred researchers in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South and Southeast Asia. Uh, Michelle has a background in academic and scholarly publishing and has worked as a project manager, researcher, editor and publisher in the open access OER and open data terrain since 2008. Um, and then our second presenter as part of today's uh, webinar will be Thomas King. He is the project curator for the Raw 4D um, program. Uh, he previously served as a student coordinator for the Vice Chancellor's OER Adaptation Project, as well as a research assistant for the Scholarly Communication in Africa program. Um, his research interests are OERs, open data, open data de-identification and management, and he's going to be sharing uh, more about this. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Michelle. Thank you, Nicola. Can everybody hear me okay? I don't know if anybody hears me. Okay, great. Hi. Hi. Thanks to Nicola and Jakob for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, the, the subject of research data management is becoming quite a hot topic. Um, and we sure, I'm sure you've heard some talk of this already. Um, Thomas and I together are the curation and dimination team of the raw for d project and we're going to share with you just some of the insights and the lessons learned from the work that we've done in raw for d and I hope in the, the process demystify some of the thinking around research data management I think the term has started to become quite scary to people and unnecessarily onerous. It's not to say that this work is is easy and it's not time consuming, but we think it's very exciting and very important. So we'd like to share with you today um, a bit about our approach. Um, just to say on the raw for d project, we are a research initiative that works in the area of open education, a large-scale networked project working with researchers um, in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia, everywhere from Colombia through Africa up into Afghanistan um, and Mongolia. So we work with a wide range of researchers in very different geopolitical contexts, in very different research traditions, and with very different focus areas. Um, we're united by a passion for open, um, but some of our, our researchers are based in universities, more traditional research type institutions. Other researchers are based in NGOs. Um, so a wide uh, range and varying focus in terms of ambitions and experience in working with data. Uh, just a point that our work we've done around data publication in the raw 4 d project forms part of our curation and dissemination strategy. Because our project has been focused on developing an empirical baseline of research and knowledge around open education in the Global South. The curation and dissemination work was recognized by our funder and by the project management team as being of central importance. So we're quite lucky in that sense, in that 
we haven't had to argue or try and sell a curation and dissemination focus. There has been an intrinsic appreciation for the importance of this work when you're trying to build the visibility, uh, the reach, and the impact of a research project. Um, in terms of our strategy, I, I think it's important to stress that we see this as a service. Our project is comprised of 18 sub-projects in 21 countries, over 100 researchers. And Thomas and I, in our role as the curation and dissemination team, are here to provide a service to those researchers in the network. Um, we know that people are very busy, and people have varying levels of proficiency in all kinds of scholarly communication. So we're here as support. We're also here as support to our principal investigators in terms of the work that they have been doing. Um, as you can imagine, researchers uh, in a project of this kind are producing a lot of work. A large part of what Thomas and I do is focused just on putting things in places and describing them appropriately so that we ourselves can go back and find them easily. And this has been particularly important for the work that the PIs have done in their synthesis activity. Um, I want to say something about infrastructure. Um, in the context that we work, uh, most of our, our researchers are based at institutions or within organizations that do not have embedded curatorial platforms, such as institutional repositories. So part of our function has also been to establish a centralized collection and to gather the work, place it in a single space. Um, and part of this um, approach has been designed to mitigate against the fact that many of our researchers do not have institutional repositories or similar spaces where they can archive and share their work. Um, and ultimately, we do this because we want our work to be reused and available in the long term. And we've worked really closely with our communications consultant. Um, I think you'll get the sense as we speak that to do this work that we're talking about is part of a larger workflow. And ultimately, if you want to go to all the trouble of managing your data optimally, describing it well, and then keeping it somewhere safe, you also want to tell people about it. So the importance of having an integrated communications and dissemination strategy is the, the, the kind of the cherry on top, if you like, of doing all of this work, because it remains a challenge for people to be able to find what you have done. So moving more specifically into the data management component of what we're doing, um, principally we're working on uh, the, the assumption or on the definition that the curatorial work we're doing is about organizing content. And we believe that organizing and profiling that content effectively increases the potential for others to reuse it and to cite it. Um, we have seen firsthand how the curatorial agenda drives greater rigor in the research process. There's something about being organized systematically throughout your research process that has a, a kind of knock-on effect, if you like, that when you're organized in your data management, it makes for an organized research process. We see that very clearly. Um, in our context, um, the raw for d the, our grant conditions stip stipulate that copyright always rests with the author in all forms of content produced. So the work we have done has relied very heavily on the willingness of certain researchers and authors to engage. And I will say up front, it's very hard for a third party to do this work, near impossible even, um, unless you have the buy-in of the researcher. Um, that, that's important not only for, for 
ease of the activity, but for a range of issues from from ethical and privacy and ownership perspectives as well. So in terms of our approach, we have been platform and, and format agnostic. We work in what um, we would think of as, as small data, as opposite to the conversation that you might hear a lot of around big data, the big, convers the big data conversation. So our researchers have not been producing terabytes of complex, um, computationally driven research data. Um, our data is complex in its own way. We have been working with both qualitative and quantitative data, um, but there is nothing grandiose about it, if you like. We have literally worked with interview transcripts that are in Word files. We have worked with Excel spreadsheets. And I'd like to stress this point because we still think that that data is very important to share and that the process of preparing and managing that data has a lot of benefit for the researcher. So we work on the principle um, within our project of sharing openly by default as long as it's valuable, that it's legal, and that it's ethical. And we have processes, a kind of checklist, if you like, that we, that we work through when considering what data to share and whether we will share data. But um, the issue of, of utility is very important here. We know that we can't share everything. And we know we must share it when researchers are ready. So util utility and readiness, I think, are two really important interconnected principles here. Um, I want to say something about quality assurance. Um, quality is, is a big concern in the area of, of data management. I, I think people are concerned. Well, I, I think researchers have many fears around sharing data. One of those fears is that other people are going to come and take your data and do something that you don't want them to do, or that they're not going to understand your data. For people accessing other researchers' data, there's the question of how do I know that this is good data? What, what is the mechanism? by which this data has somehow been vetted or approved. And, and I don't have the answers to those questions. This is one of the issues that the data community is grappling with. But I think we will very soon start to see mechanisms emerge where there is some form of certification and third-party validation of, of open data. In terms of, of of the function that Thomas and I serve, or the function we play as curators, it's very difficult for us to act as arbiters of quality. And we don't attempt to do that. Um, essentially, the quality of the data is going to be informed by the research process and the data collection processes, and ultimately by the researcher. Um, so we, we work on a system of trust. And um, our, our PI and other aspects of the project are focused on rigor. But as you can, I hope, as you can see, there's a, a sense of constant knock-on effect. Good research processes, good data collection mechanisms equals, hopefully in the, in the long run, good data. Um, that said, curators can make a really important contribution in terms of how data is organized and presented and named and where it's put so that it makes it easier to interpret and reuse and find that data down the line. And again, I want to stress here, it's not just about other people being able to find your data. It's about you yourself being able to, whether it's in three years or three months' time, being able to come back and immediately hone in on an aspect of your data that you'd like to go back to. In our experience, academics are so busy that a lot of activity becomes haphazard, and things get done in the moment. It can be quite hard 
to go back and find things in the long run. Um, in terms of the, the point around quality, I want to also just say something about the language we've been using and the discourse has has moved increasingly from talking about open data or data sharing to data publishing. And I think it's it's an important terminology issue because the data publishing term implies a quality assurance layer. And publishing process addresses professionalization, the, the packaging work that we do as part of data publication, which is the uh, process of ascribing metadata, the terms and documentation that describe a data set. Um, it is the, the cleaning of the data so that it is legible and readable to a third party. There are a set of functions that are that constitute an important publishing value add. So just as traditionally a publisher of a book would add value by typesetting, proofreading, and marketing, so curators in a data publishing process add value in the management of data. And similarly, it's about packaging so that your work can be effectively accessed and understood. Um, and then again, just to stress the point about communicating. Once you've done all this work, you really want another layer of activity, either by yourself or by another person. If you're lucky to have a communications person who gives you support in that area, to profile and disseminate your work. So we use blogs, we use Facebook, we use Twitter, we have a mailing list that we send announcements to, and all of this keeps the pulse going around the work that we do and the outputs that we're trying to profile. Um, I'd, I'd like to say something briefly about policy. Um, as you may know, the, the funder mandates around data management and the articulation of data management plans as part of a grant proposal process are increasingly being insisted upon and there is increasing focus in this area and in the wave of that there are many institutions are developing policies around research data management all of which are framed in the largely in the, the context of responsible research conduct and the argument is that if you are acting responsibly and professionalizing your research process then research data management is an intrinsic component of that endeavor. That said, in many cases, we see that, that policies and mandates may be necessi necessary, but not sufficient. Um, it's crucial that the individual researcher sees the value of doing this work. Um, not only because of the time that's involved, but because if you want to share and manage your data effectively, it needs to be done with a commitment and a passion for that data. And there's nobody better to do that than the researcher. So I know this might sound like I'm contradicting myself in terms of the role that Thomas and I play as curators, but for curators, ideally you want to work with a researcher who's keen to share their data and who's keen to go into that partnership with you. Um, and we've seen some really interesting things happen as researchers get to know their data better as they're preparing it for publication and as they're getting into the detail of managing that data effectively. So there is a value proposition, but I think that this, this virtuous cycle of publishing and sharing only becomes really effective when the researcher herself sees the, the value of the process. Um, we know, just just make a point about, in, about intellectual property policies, um, various institutions and organizations increasingly have their own IP policies, um, and those IP policies are going to 
stipulate the ownership conditions around outputs, um, whether that's for teaching material, whether it's for articles and, or chapters that you publish, or for the data that you produce in the course of your research work. So in some instances we have seen in South Africa certainly there are institutions which hold the copyright to data that does constrain researchers activity in terms of being able to release that data openly. Um, it does not mean that you can't manage your data effectively. It just places some um, complications perhaps around that final stage of publishing and sharing. But I think institutions who are serious about data management are working through these issues as relates to IP policies. Uh, intrinsically, this is a, a team effort. Um, the point that I was making about workflows, um, they're, they're in any data publication process, and those processes are going to be very different in different circum circumstances, in different disciplines, depending on what kind of data is being collected, on the size of the data, on the amount of resourcing that is available to the project or to the researcher. But increasingly we see that in this publishing system and workflow, there, an e there is an ecosystem of players. Researchers, curators, publishers, in some cases libraries are getting very involved in research data management, um, whether that's in the actual practice of doing data management planning or managing data while it is being collected or publishing it after. It is ideally, I think this is not a solo enterprise. Um, and there is the benefit of having many eyes when you work in a team. So we see the rise of what we call intermediaries who work in the space to facilitate the data management and publishing process. And curators like Thomas and I are is an example of those kinds of intermediaries. There are challenges in certain project contexts where those intermediaries are attached to a specific project and a grant ends and teams move on. Um, and then there is a relationship that's severed between researchers and intermediaries or those skills are lost to an institution. And that's something that I think has to be grappled with. Um, I also want to make the point that intermediaries increasingly not only play a curatorial function, but do also have a role to play in terms of giving the data legs, if you like, and giving it some other life and interpretation. So we have seen instances where intermediaries are also involved in generating analytics, um, gathering usage data around the application and citation of data sets. Intermediaries are becoming involved in generating visualizations of data which make the work more compelling for other researchers to engage with. So a whole new set of services and functions um, that, are, that are arising from this, this partnership within the ecosystem between the researcher and, and other support entities like curators. Um, in our institution, we have um, many challenges associated with what we call casualization this coming and going of staff, um, and I think that that's a real factor that um, stands to hinder research data management in the long term and the building of skills. So in the context of, of our partnership and our ecosystem that we work in, we're very lucky at the University of Cape Town to have a long-standing, very established data publisher called Data First. Um, they traditionally focused on survey data, but, uh, but have expanded their scope and have worked with us in professionalizing our data publishing approach. 
and the, they are, are data scientists in many instances and people who have the expertise that Thomas and I do not purport to have and that we can't develop in the course of a project. They have literally spent 20 years building expertise. The point I'd like to make around this is that you don't have to know it all, that there are entities out there and support units and organizations, even if they're not in your within your immediate institution, there are entities within the institution. Um, at the University of Cape Town, we are also working with Figshare, which has a large scale initiative underway to support South African institutions. So there is help and there is expertise out there that can be accessed. Um, I've included this here just as a link for you to access the raw for d open data collection on the Data First data portal. If you're interested, <clears throat> you can follow the URL that's on the slide. Um, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up just with a, a few higher level kind of points or lessons learned from our side. And the first of them is, and I, I can't stress this enough, and it's because we've seen it in such an authentic way. We've seen how openness increases rigor, that the process of preparing your work for others to use and access makes you look at it with different eyes, makes you look at it more closely than you would have, makes you interrogate your own work in a different kind of way, and ultimately helps you understand your work um, in a whole new way. So the, pr the process of preparing data for publication and of managing your data optimally really drives the professionalization of your practice overall. Um, secondly, the idea that introducing a curatorial focus and data publishing agenda midway through a project poses many challenges. I didn't mention this at the outset, but this was the case in our project. We had, an, from the outset, an intrinsic ambition to work with as openly as possible. So we went into the project with open research ambitions, but the open data and open publishing, open data publishing work has grown in the last few years as the project has evolved. And so our curatorial strategy has grown. It's been very difficult for us to try and do some of these activities in retrospect. And Thomas will say a little bit more about that in his pre presentation. Um, I, I hope that you come away from this with a sense that this work is doable, but I must stress that doing this work takes time and resourcing, particularly if you're going to aim for this professionalization and to do it really well. That said, there's a really compelling value proposition that I think speaks for itself. Um, we know that sharing can be threatening and a little bit scary in terms of exposing weakness, but um, we think that this is the reason why, why science, why research, why we do what we do, so that we learn from our mistakes, we learn from the mistakes of others. Nobody's work is infallible um, and beyond reproach. Um, this, is, this publishing and sharing activity happens in the spirit of driving better practice, of improving constantly as much as, as we can. And finally, to end on the principle that I truly believe in this context, um, the old adage that well begun is half done is absolutely critical. Start from the outset of a research process thinking about data management, about data management planning. There are a lot of resources available online and we can, through Nicola, share some links to data management planning tools that are available online if you'd like to start experimenting with those tools. Um, it would be an effort well worth your while. So that's it from my side.
I'm going to hand over to Thomas, who's going to talk about our curatorial and data management processes in a little more detail. Hi everyone, Thomas here. Um, thanks for your time. Let me just see if I can get to my slides. There we go. So Michelle has covered quite a lot of the foundational pieces from my presentation, so we can skip a couple of slides. But just as a um, recap, RoofD is a network project, uh, 18 different sub-projects, 26 different countries in the Global South, with over 100 researchers, supported by the Network Hub team, of which Michelle and I are members. Um, we've got data sets in multiple languages, and as Michelle mentioned, we collect in both qualitative and quantitative data. And in 2015, Michelle and I launched an open data initiative, which was designed to try and bring people on board um, with the idea of sharing open data, which was not mandated at the beginning of the project. So we started somewhere halfway through, if you like. It's just a quick map of showing all our different project sites. So you can see we cross most of the globe, and we cross primarily areas in the developing world. In fact, I think exclusively areas in the developing world. Now, Michelle has gone over this, so I won't have to spend too much time, but the way we um, tend to frame why people should share their data is that, as part of our project, we are building an empirical base for future research. By putting your data out there, you are helping to contribute to building your field and to provide something that people can then use in comparison or develop them using new frameworks or analyze them according to new methodologies. Um, it is also coherent with a generally open approach, meaning that we like to share everything. We communicate openly, we share openly, we publish under open access, we um, use Creative Commons license on all our outputs, and so on and so on. As Michelle mentioned earlier, this is now becoming a global, um, an international trend that many global funders, particularly those in the EU and increasingly in North America, now require some sort of data sharing activity or plan. Um, pretty much everyone now requires some sort of research data management plan. I'll get to the difference between that shortly. But it's going to sound like it's hopping on about it. But the real core is to improve your rigor. Sharing data openly, as Michelle mentioned, really does make it better. And because it's like the same thing with publishing. You only publish what you're very comfortable with. So if you know you have to share your data, you're going to make sure that data set is tight, tight, tight. Um, Hi, uh, Olufemi, I noticed your thing. Uh, we'll address the questions at the end about which areas were included and which weren't. Um, now, data shouldn't always be shared. There are reasons not to share data, particularly when it inclu includes disclosed information, which is identifying information about research participants, particularly at-risk groups. Also, when the data is of poor quality, for various reasons, or when you have some sort of publication agreement or patenting process which requires that you don't share your data or share your data at a later point. Uh, I suspect number two, when your data is of poor quality or fears about your data being poor quality, um, keep people back more than actually the um, publication agreements and patenting processes. So these are the different uh, angles which we used to encourage our participants to share through the Open Data Initiative, because once again, this came through, um, halfway through the project and wasn't even a mandatory process. So we had to encourage people, we had to recruit them. And we recruited through social just th emphasizing sh social just through sharing, um, because you're building up this, this network of materials. Um, by emphasizing personal reputation, everything you publish builds up your own international profile, which of course is very important for academics, particularly those looking for international collaborations. And most importantly, by emphasizing the rigor that is required. Simply put, once again, hopping on and over, on and on about this point, but sharing your data openly means that data set's going to be beautiful by the time that it gets published. This is a list of terms I'm not going to go through, um, but it's just useful terms for your future endeavors into open data, the difference between them. Um, the only thing I'd like to uh, focus on now is the difference between anonymity and confidentiality. In an anonymous study, your personal details of your participants have never been gathered, whereas confidentiality, you're choosing not to share them. So you can't have an anonymous interview because you know who that person is, therefore you've gathered information about them. 
anonymous survey is something sent out to large lists which don't collect email addresses or flyers tucked into I mean, ballot boxes are anonymous. Interviews and those kinds of things are confidential. That's just a point of term. In the Raw4D project, uh, the curation dissemination team focused on this, um, the latter parts of the research data management cycle, the organization, storage, documentation, and sharing of data. And we provided services in that green oval. We didn't get involved in the collection of data or the refinement of data. Because as Michelle mentioned, we're not data, we're not subject experts. Researchers do have, um, I'd say monopoly, but they do own the collection and the verification and uh, quality improvement of the data. A uh, curatorial endeavor is to organize and describe that data so they can be stored and retrieved and shared possibly in the future. Now, I'm going to phrase the next bit as primarily in terms of open data sharing, but really does, there's a, a link between research data management, which is the broad set of principles of how I'm going to organize, create, store, and resource my data process, and open data sharing as kind of the most um, extreme or most open version of, of that practice. So I'm just going to be saying open data from now on, but I really mean a research data management and open sharing. It's built on two principles. There's a principle where one must be get consent from one research participants, one, one must remain ethical in terms of ethics clearance processes, and one must adhe um, adhere to your legal requirements. At the same time, also to create something which is a comprehensible data set, which is coherent and valuable. And the tension between these two things can be simplified as two statements. First, do no harm. So you're going to need to organize and de-identify your um, your data in, in um, the way that you are protecting the confidentiality or anonymity, depending on which one you did, of your research participants, and that you're being ethical and consensual in your data process. Now, consent and ethics is, uh, it varies between region on how the process is set up, but they're broadly the similar kinds of things. Don't expose your research participants to uh, dangerous side effects that may come from the, the data. Um, I'm primarily talking about a humanities point of view, but it could also apply to economics data, such as household survey data, or if you're doing studies in criminology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At the same time, if you're going to go through a de-identification process, you shouldn't go overboard. So you're removing as little as is ethical to ensure that the data is rich. Um, the point of open data, one of the main points of open data is that other people might take your data and reanalyze it according to a different framework or for a different set of reasons or purposes. So if you remove everything except the things that you yourself have used in your data, uh, your article or book or whatever your output is, you're really making sure that the only thing that people can do with your data is recreate your work. That's not particularly useful. It, it reduces the utility of open data sharing. So what I suggest is take as the unit of analysis as the guide, um, which means that if I am doing a study on male and female academics in a context, I will need to leave the genders in. I won't de-identify, um, yeah, remove uh, or the gender from the, the data set that I'm looking at, so I can still make a, bit, a unit of comparison. And what we ended up in raw for d is we invent, uh, invented, we adopted a data interrogation process, which involves a, period, a process of constantly rereading the data and looking at different things to, to improve upon it. For instance, things of coherence of the format and layout to make sure data sets looked like they were arranged uh, in the same way. And once we had done that, we went back and reread re the data, see what emerged, then start looking at fixing typos, identifying anomalous data sets and, or data objects going back to our research and saying, can you explain this? Is this a mistake? Is this important? Back to rereading the data, a validation process. Once again, this is ready with the academic or researcher by identifying accounting for missing data. Um, in some cases, data was not present to be analyzed and just making sure it's very obvious to the third party reader who comes across this. And lastly, the de-identification process. Now, qualitative and quantitative de-identification are slightly different. Qualitative is research is uh, things like research transcripts, focus group data, and so forth. While quantitative data is data can be, generally speaking, represented as some sort of table. 
so variables. And the whole denitrification activity is pretty much in the same kind of ecosystem as cleaning and validation. So as you de-identify a data set, you go through and start seeing, oh, there's typos, oh, there's missing data. I can um, talk to that going forward or film myself and so forth. Um, and these processes uh, will be articulated in your research data management plan, which I'll get to I'm running out of time in a little bit. Um, I was going to skip this because we are running short. I'm just going to give you two, two examples of a qualitative and a quantitative um, set, how we approach the identification. So the red um, items are potentially disclosive piece, uh, piece of information, things that could be used to identify this particular research participant. And in the second paragraph, same paragraph, but the blue um, text in brackets is how I personally have changed that data to retain as much of the value of the data set as possible while making sure Susan Tsvangarai, who doesn't exist as far as I can tell, I just made it up for this thing, can't be identified. Uh, you'll have to go and read that as your, your own time. Here's an example of quantitative de-identification. So we have this data set here. We have got the ID numbers, the gender, age, the school that they went to, the um, education level of the mother, and the household income. And how I've chosen to de-identify it by changing the ID to a research participant number, so I can still find that person's data, but someone else won't be able to know. Because if I have an ID number someone, I can go and find that particular person. I've changed their gender in this case because that wasn't something I was looking at in my study. I've kept the age because in conjunction with other pieces of information I've removed, I'm confident that knowing that uh, respondent number one is 36 years old and goes to the first school in my study, elides enough information that someone won't be able to go and find a student with the ID number 47145678. Now, I'm just going to talk briefly about resourcing in the last three minutes. Um, sometimes people think that data curation requires a lot of complicated technical or computing resources. It really doesn't. This is primarily a human, uh, a human cost. So in our project, we had Michelle and I to do some of this work for individual resources, postdocs possibly, senior students, or you're going to have to um, budget some of your own time to develop the kind of competencies. This is familiarity with open licensing, creative commons, and de-identification skills. Software is not an issue. There are multiple open platforms which don't require any kind of subject integration or institutional login or anything like that, such as a node or a fixture, that anyone can use. So the technology here is not the stumbling block. It's time and competency. There are challenges. So we collected in multiple different languages, a lot of Spanish language data sets from our South American sub-projects which obviously me as a monolingual English speaker can't de-identify. So in that case, we actually had to go to the researcher in question and ask them to ensure that the disclosed information, such as names and ID numbers and positions and so forth, had been removed so that the research participant was um, non, non unidentifiable. It's quite, a useful, it's quite a fun process, though, in some ways, because actually helping researchers develop their own skills in that regard. Um, we had some problems with post-hoc consent, so because our um, Open Data Initiative came through halfway in the process, uh, in some cases people had already signed consent forms, um, so we had to go back to our research participants and say, are you happy with your open data being shared openly, this is what that means, this is how we're going to identify it and license and so forth. And in some cases we couldn't find our original participants, they had moved, they retired and so forth, and it actually stopped us from sharing some data sets that we otherwise would have liked to share. Um, and whenever you have a project like ours, where you've got data collected by multiple researchers according to different methodologies, people collect data in different ways. So the organization and coherence of those data sets can be difficult to ensure across different contexts. And that brings us back to Michelle's point, which is start open. Um, first of all, what? Well begun is half done. If you start off with the intention to share openly, if you write your consent forms to make sure that they explain explicit about your open data and so forth, it just makes this process so much more, um, so much easier. And then even if in the end you can't end up sharing your data, your open consent form can allow for it but not mandate it. So you lost nothing by going through the process of building it from the beginning, even if in the end you aren't actually able to share. Um, okay, no time left. Very briefly, 
a good starting point for this, if this all feels completely overwhelming to you, is to create a research data management plan or an RDM. Uh, the UCT has one, uh, the Digital Curation Center, that's UCT, uh, DC, okay, that, that Nick is going to share. It's a very simple thing which asks you a set of questions on where you're going to store the data, where you're going to collect it, who's going to be responsible for it, what kind of resourcing do you need, do you need to buy a hard drive to store the data, do you need to put it on a repository and so forth. It's a very straightforward process which will start asking you the kind of questions that you'll need to go and find out more about. It is also very, very much a um, standard process in international funders that you have an RDM before you get funding and increasing at the institutional level as well. Okay, I'm going to end up there because we need to uh, have some time for question and answer sessions. Um, cool. Uh, Nicola, do you want to? <laughs> or should I just start reading through the questions from... Okay, I'm just going to go in reverse order then, so asking Julian's, answering Julian's question. Uh, archiving and storing of D-data, how big are your data sets? Um, we're a humanities project, primarily dealing with human data. Um, we're not a big data project. Um, the entirety of our data sets is less than, all our data sets together is less than 100 megs. So we don't deal with um, archiving and storage problems generally. That said, your free services like Figshare and um, Zenodo and so forth usually offer between 1 and 5 gigs of free storage. Um, and in fact, I think Zenodo doesn't even actually have a limit. It just has a limit per actual file upload. So if you're dealing with things like medical data or astronomy data, massive data sets, that's when um, storage becomes more, like the physical buying storage space becomes more important. It wasn't important for us. I hope that answers your question. Um, I don't think we had a limit with our data first collection, but we never came anywhere close to reaching storage limits. No problem. Um, yes. Data security. Um, Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> uh, so it's peace of mind with the data. Okay. Um, sharing data openly the intent is that the data is going to be reused and refound. Um, so in a sense, we kind of sidestep this whole issue. The problem with Cambridge Analytica is that they took data which was not ever exposed to be shared and shared it. Our data is intended to be shared. So we're not afraid if people go and find the data. The other side of that is making sure that the research participants themselves can't be discovered. And that is a de-identification issue, which becomes before you share your data, to make sure that you have gone through the data set and remove personal identifiers. So that's not um, a data sharing issue per se, that's more of an ethics issue. Um, and that is just a rigorous and uh, back and forward process of making sure that you have removed the primary identifiers, things like names, addresses, phone numbers, ID numbers, and secondary identifiers such as uh, positions. For instance, if I know my research participant was the vice chancellor of UCT in 2017, I can work out who that person was immediately. And Michelle is just writing me a note. Hi, I just wanted to reiterate on, on Thomas's point about the, the first do no harm principle. And, and linking back to something that I referenced as well is that you make decisions about what you're going to publish and how you're going to publish it. Certainly in our context, if there was any suggestion of a risk to a researcher, a participant, an institution or a funder, we would simply not publish that data. So we are not advocating or part of a, a free-for-all, slap, slap anything on the web approach. Um, you do need to be considered and strategic in your approach. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I forget which slide it is on. Um, so when... Oh, I've gone too far. 
the slide that I can maybe breeze through too fast, when should they should not be shared. Um, so a lot of us deal with research um, sets with those groups there. So children, displaced and refugee uh, groups, um, women in many contexts and so forth. You do need to be very, very careful in research ethics generally when working with those groups. Um, that said, we did end up sharing a set on uh, girls' education in Afghanistan. And people blow up schools in Afghanistan if they try and teach girls. So it's certainly possible to share data sets which deal with at-risk groups, but needs to be incredible rigor about where that data is shared and how it's de-identified. And in many cases, we simply did not collect data at all. So we never found any data about the students whatsoever. Um, the group, the sub-project working in Afghanistan never sent us that data and we were very careful when talking to them about the open data sharing process that they were not ever to share with us any sort of raw data about student IDs or names or ages or any kind of information like that. We collected on the courses and how the courses were taught instead of that kind of disclosive dangerous data. Yes. What data they did send to us was then de-identified before it came to us, and then we did another round on on top of that to make sure there was nothing that could be shared. I mean, that could use, be used to split. And that took months. It was a it was an engaged process. We took a lot of thinking um, behind that. Uh, Olafemi, I think you uh, responded. Michelle said um, not the question about Nigeria, the representation in Nigeria. Uh, Michelle, do you want to speak to that? Hi, Olive. I think we're back. Can can you hear me? Anybody can give me a thumbs up. Can... Great. Um, Olufemi, I'm not sure where I lost you. I'm saying that the, the Raw for D project is a, a grant-funded, time-specific project which ends in June. So nothing can be done in this stage, at this stage, of bringing more sub-projects on board. But in terms of getting in line with data management practice and data publishing activity, anybody can do it from anywhere. It helps, certainly, if you have institutional support. But if you are interested and you'd like to take the initiative, I suggest doing a bit of Googling, checking out the links which Nicola has shared to the DCC Data Management Planning collection of resources. Um, I think Nick, Nicola also shared the um, UCT data management plan resource and to start experimenting and to start thinking about those questions. Data management planning or the plans are typically phrased around a set of questions. Start thinking about how you would ask, answer those questions and the next time you start a, a new research initiative or a new stage in your research, um, begin with those questions in mind and answer them for yourself. 
Hall of Fame, if I can also add that um, the an institution I know of in Nigeria itself is the National Open University of Nigeria, N O U N. Oh, are you there? Um, but also OER Africa um, as a web portal and a collaborative portal. But as Michelle says, this is a very useful tool just for um, developing your own processes. And then when applying for funding, you can already demonstrate, I already have research sediment and management plans for previous projects or my own work. It's just that extra uh, feather in your cap for um, showing that you are as aware of the data issues as the funders themselves are. Okay, great. Um, I think that wraps up. I um, don't think we have any more questions. It is now 2 o'clock and I want to say thank you to Michelle and Thomas for such an exciting webinar today. I think you've all got us inspired to start checking out data management plans and how to de-identify our data. Um, yeah, I want to thank you, uh, Gillian, Nikki, um, Irene, or Femi. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I see folks are typing. Um, okay, great. All right, I'm going to end the recording now, and let's continue discussion in the Facebook uh, event page. Okay, great. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Olafemi. Okay, bye, everyone. Have a great day further.